Welcome back for module two of the Financial Toolkit for Lawyers. In this module, we're going to go deeper into the accounting process. And here, we're going to go through the steps accountants actually take to make the financial statements that we will eventually analyze. To help you do this, I've created a worksheet that takes you through every step of the process. You can access it at the link below. I recommend that as you listen to this lecture, you fill out that worksheet as we complete the various steps so that you can also be a part of the creation of financial statements. This will help you understand what goes into financial statements, and accordingly, as an attorney, you'll be able to get more out of them and understand what they mean. Let's get started with Chapter 2 in the Financial Toolkit. We're going to next discuss the accounting process. This Chapter 2 builds heavily on Chapter 1's foundation. So hopefully you have already done the reading for Chapter 1, done the pre-work for Chapter 1 on lyrics, attended the Chapter 1 lecture, asked your questions about Chapter 1, and completed the Chapter 1 challenge question, in which case you are in great shape to move on to Chapter 2. Before we move on, let's all together take a minute to just review what we learned in Chapter 1 and then move forward into learning additional topics for Chapter 2 that build on Chapter 1. Financial accounting is the production of reports so that external users can make business decisions. Businesses can be generally structured in two main ways. On the one hand, partnerships, which are not separate entities. They are flow-through entities. They are an aggregate of the people that form them. Or on the other hand, corporations, which are separate entities, which have their own IRS uh, tax status, uh, which uh, block liabilities from impacting the owners and are therefore very important for business. GAAP, or generally accepted accounting principles, are standard principles that govern the production of financial statements. Those key statements are the income statement, the statement of cash flows and the balance sheet. And when we record entries on these statements, we want to keep in mind always the fundamental accounting equation, which is assets equals liabilities plus equity. And that requires a double entry transaction analysis where we follow three steps. We first determine which accounts are affected and will always affect more than one account, usually two accounts, one which will go up, uh, and one which will go down, or ones that are on the other side of the balance sheet and both go up or down together. We determine if the account would increase or decrease. We make sure that the net of these effects are zero. In other words, that it's balanced and we record the entry. Next, we're going to move into chapter two, where we are going to first begin by describing the asset liability and equity accounts in more detail and talking again about the effect of debits and credits on each. We're going to continue using double entry accounting in a more sophisticated way. Hopefully now you feel ready for that. Uh, because of what we did in chapter one. We're going to prepare a trial balance. So you're going to try your hand at drafting financial statements, which by drafting, you will understand what goes into it and you will get more out of consuming them. And we're going to record transactions in a general ledger and finally define the accounting cycle. So you get a sense of how this goes on. And really these first two chapters are so important because once you have taken the time to study these first two chapters, uh, you really should now have a pretty good understanding about what accounting is, how it works, and how people use it. So without further ado, let's get into chapter two. Accounts are, well, pretty essential to accounting. We, In accounting, we want to put 
things in their right places. That's a huge part of it is categorizing things properly. Accounts are like categories and they're not necessarily separate bank accounts, although they could be. It's not necessarily as structured as all that, but in accounting, we need to make sure we're tracking everything accurately and attributing debits and credits in the right places so that we actually can understand when we look at them what happened that year in our business. The collection of all these accounts is called a ledger. You can also say uh, the books, and we talk about booking the accounts, which basically just means recording them in an appropriate place. Nowadays, it could be something as simple as pen and paper, but hopefully more sophisticated people will use Excel and even Quicken or QuickBooks or even more specialized accounting software as your needs become more complex. Although there are many, many accounts based on a business's needs and operations, there are three primary types or categories of accounts. The first is an asset account. We also have liabilities accounts and equity accounts. Asset accounts are for resources that have future economic benefit for the business. Liabilities are obligations the business will have to pay in the future to creditors. And the equity account is the remainder or the retained earnings that is owed or due to shareholders. So assets are future resources. They can be used for the benefit of the business. They are good to have. You generally want more of them. And their primary purpose is in day-to-day -day operation activities. They can be used to generate revenue, either directly or indirectly. We established a separate account for each asset. Again, I will show you some examples of these accounts, but they vary from business to business. What doesn't change, however, is that every business needs assets so that it can generate revenues from them. These assets are good things that will be utilized in the future to derive economic benefit. Examples. Common asset accounts would include an accounts receivable, which is the money that is owed to you from work that you've produced. Uh, notes receivable, which is uh, debts that uh, you've issued that you, you are owed on those debts. Your office supplies, which might have some value. Uh, any inventory that you have, uh, any merchandise that you're holding on to. If you've prepaid for things like rent, insurance, etc. And for some companies, a very large asset would be their real estate, their uh, PPE, their plant, uh, property, and equipment. And so we have a category for that as well. Again, these are examples. Every business has its own specific assets. And so uh, these are just examples of common ones that you will often find as types of assets. As I mentioned before, businesses have many accounts. The particular accounts depend on the nature of the business. But there are three categories or classifications of accounts that all businesses share. Assets, liabilities, and equity. Let's now focus on liability accounts. A liability is an obligation to pay in the future. That's basically the inverse of an asset. An asset is a resource that can be used for profit in the future. A liability is a future cost that will be incurred. So we need to understand liabilities as a fundamental inverse of assets. And liabilities are also understandable as the property of the creditor. We have received that liability from someone in the sense that we now owe money to someone. We owe an obligation to someone or something. That liability, that owing that obligation to someone else, that is a liability. And it is the opposite of an asset because unlike an asset, which can be used to generate revenue in the future, a liability will generate an expense in the future. And just like assets and just like equities, liability will be classified into separate accounts for each of the liabilities because that will make it easier for us to account for what we are spending our money on. 
some examples, just examples, but common examples of liability accounts, accounts payable. People have rendered services onto you. You have not paid them yet. Those are your accounts payable. Wages payable. You have employees. You haven't paid them yet. Those are liabilities. Short-term notes and long-term notes. Those are your debts, whether they're short or long-term. We distinguish them because oftentimes they have different interest rates and unearned revenues, meaning you've gotten some money for work you haven't done yet. And so we can't book that as, uh, as a pure uh, asset because we actually owe something. We owe the work. We owe the value of that work. So these are examples of liability accounts. These are things that we have obligations to pay for. Next category is equity accounts. Equity represents the net assets owned by the owners in the business. You might think of this as the residual, right? So assets equals liabilities plus equities. So that means that equities are positive. There is value for the owners when assets are greater than liabilities. And likewise, equity can be negative. The owners have negative value in the business if liabilities are greater than assets because assets always equals liabilities plus equities. Equity represents the net assets owned by the owners in the business. In a corporation, we call them stockholders. And there are different types of equity accounts, although we're almost always going to see in a corporation at least common stock and retained earnings. Here are some examples of common equity accounts. We have common stock, which represents the investments made by the owners in the business. So they put cash into the business. They receive stock for their cash. That is value in the business. That cash is now going to go uh, into two places. Double entry accounting, right? So we have to enter everything into two places. And we're going to increase the equity because we have value from common stock. And of course, that $10 was cash. Where does that go? Cash is an asset. And so let's say there's $10,000 of investment. We increase cash by 10,000 because we literally put cash in the bank. We increase equity by 10,000 because that's how much the shareholders increased the value by adding that cash. In addition, we might have earnings from our operations. And these retained earnings also increase the value of the business. And so that will also cause equity to increase because at least theoretically, those retained earnings could later be distributed to stockholders uh, in something called a dividend. And so we're going to put that as uh, owner's equity, increasing the value of the business. So what happens to equity? Well, first off, stepping back, where does it come from? Equity comes from two places. One, the amount invested by the owners. That goes in the category, the account the equity account called common stock. Owners put money in the business, get stock in return. Boom, we have common stock account. In addition, the business can make money as it goes about its business. And to the extent that it has made a profit and accounts are now higher than liabilities in a period, we need things to balance. Well, we can't have it that accounts are greater than liabilities and that's it. No, where's the rest go? The rest goes to equity because assets equals liabilities plus equity. And so we would increase both the asset and on the other side, the retained earnings account in equity. Now, further, what happens to retained earnings? Well, they can be retained, right? And, and that, that might just be a number on paper that goes up and down based on how well the business is doing. It can be paid to shareholders. That's called a dividend. Dividends are a deduction from equity because we're actually taking retained earnings and we're giving it to shareholders. We'd probably also deduct cash at the same time. And retained earnings will also be affected by revenues and expenses. Uh, retained earnings will be increased by revenues and decreased by expenses. So those are subcategories of the equity concept. How do we account for all these increases and decreases in accounts? Well, in order to maintain our double entry accounting, we use what's called a T account. A T account looks like the letter T. And so it's called a T account. It shows increases and decreases in an account. The left side records debit entries and the right side records credit entries. A debit increases assets and a credit 
increases liabilities or vice versa, a debit decreases liabilities and a credit decreases assets. So under a T account, the type of account determines whether an increase or a decrease in a particular transaction is represented by a debit or a credit. Again, for assets and also for dividends and expenses, increases are recorded by positive debits or negative credits. For financial transactions that affect liabilities, plus common stock and revenues, Increases are recorded by positive credits and decreases by negative debits. Trust me, it sounds more complicated than it is. Let's take a look at this visually. Here's a visual look at T accounts, right? So each account has its own T. We could have an asset account. In fact, there's many different types of asset accounts like cash, uh, there are liability accounts like accounts payable. Within any one of those accounts, we can write a T. We can put debits on the left, credits on the right. And yes, we always, always, always put debits on the left and credits on the right. And we're dealing when we're dealing with things like assets, dividends, and expenses, debits are increases and credits are decreases. But what's on the other side of the fundamental equation, right? Assets equals liabilities plus equity. And so the opposite thing has to happen to things on the other side of the equation. So on the one side, we have assets. Anything that makes an asset go up has to make a liability go down or has to make a different asset go down or what have you. But again, I'm being generalized here. In general, you increase assets, you have to increase liabilities. And so the same action is going to have an opposite effect on either side of the fundamental equation. So liabilities will always be decreased by debits and increased by credits. Maybe another way to think about this is based again on looking at the accounting equation. And remember, assets equals liabilities plus equity. And things like dividends, expenses, revenues, and common stock are all subcategories of equity. So how do we record an increase in these categories such that the, it always balances? Well, an increase in assets, we call that a debit. Therefore, that same increase needs to be on the other side of the T for the other side of the equation. So a debit in assets results in a credit in liabilities or equity. A credit in asset results in a debit for liabilities and equity. The following summary shows how debits and credits are used to record increases and decreases in various types of accounts. The account balance is then just pretty simple math. I mean, not even like algebra, like addition and subtraction. The account balance is determined by adding and subtracting the increases and decreases, the debits and credits in the account according to whether a debit increases or decreases a particular item. Again, debits and credits are kind of conceptual. And through this lecture, we hope to make this more tangible. So let's take a look at some more specific examples now. Let's take a look next at what is probably the most commonly used account, the cash account. And I like this example because we can all relate to cash. It's those green things in your wallet. When you get them, you're happy. When you lose them, you're sad. They are assets because they are resources that can be used in the future that you can deploy and, and get positive value out of. There are things you want to have more of. Cash, it's something you can use to purchase goods and services. It's an asset. And when we increase an asset, we put that in the debit column. That part, whether it's debits or credits, that's a convention. So we just have to accept it. But over a period of time, we might have many transactions in cash. You know, you might get your allowance from your mother and then go to the store and buy bubble gum. And those are both cash transactions. In one case, a debit when it increased it, when you got your allowance. In another case, a credit when you spent it, bought your bubble gum.
And at the end of a whole period, in this case, there were, there were a number of transactions. We can actually reflect all of them, and what we can do is add them up. Well, we would add the debits and subtract the credits to be more precise. Or we could say we could add them all up and the credits are negative numbers. In any event, we're going to plus, plus, plus the debits, minus, minus, minus the credits, and we'll either get a positive or a negative number. If we get a positive number and we're in the type of account in which a positive number is a debit, we're going to write that number in the debit column which we have done here. There is more debits than credits over this period. Therefore, there's a positive number in the debits column, $3,700. And because we usually expect these accounts to have positive amounts in them, whenever we have a positive uh, balance, we call that a normal balance. This is a normal balance because cash is an asset account. Asset accounts put the positive numbers in the debits column. Here we have more debits than credits, meaning we have positive debits. Since we have a positive number, 3,700 in this case, in the positive column, we call that a normal balance. And the other thing to note about the balance, it's super important because we're going to need to take that balance and extrapolate that into our T accounts in our next step. The balance of cash, that's what's going to go into our T accounts in the next step. So that column 3,700 of balance, which again is the, uh, is the sum of the debits minus the sum of the credits, or you could think of it as plus, plus, plus the debits minus, minus, minus the credits. You end up with a number, in this case a positive number. That number is the balance, and that balance is what we're going to communicate into the trial balance, and we're going to use that trial balance to create the rest of the financial statements. Here's a simpler example looking at from the other way. Uh, we had 700 debits to accounts payable, 5,000 credits. Well, uh, which one is larger? This one's easy. Uh, this one, the credits is larger. So we're going to write the balance, which again is just the total, and it doesn't balance anything. So it's, in my opinion, a poor choice of words. But hey, you know, I can only rail... Uh, against windmills for so long. The the total amount here, 5,000 minus 700 equals 4,300. We put that in the column with the greater amount, which in this case is credits, and we say that this is a credit account. And when we are dealing with things like liabilities, we call a normal balance uh, in accounts payable to credit, meaning we expect or we traditionally would put that number in the credits column for liabilities such as accounts payable. And so when we have that state of affairs, when we have the total, the balance in the credits column for a liabilities account, we call that a normal balance. So we have here a normal balance of 4,300 in accounts payable. You may at some point experience what is called a chart of accounts. A chart of accounts is a list of accounts. It's, it's called a chart because, well, this one makes sense. It's usually put in a chart where there are categories or, or ranges of numbers which are going to be attributed to certain types of accounts. And as we discussed in the last lesson, it's helpful in many businesses to distinguish between different types of assets and to get really granular because that helps us see what we're spending our money on, where we're getting our money from, and uh, still we want to categorize them. So, for example, a common practice is to arrange the chart of accounts in a manner uh, to make it easy to use. So um, items 100 through 199 will be our types of assets. And then we'll go to 200 to 299 for types of liabilities, uh, 300 to 399 for our equity. And then if we decide to break this out further, 500 to 599 for revenue accounts and 600 to 699 for expense accounts. Now, as I mentioned previously, we don't have a separate literal bank account for all these things. The idea of accounting is to track all of these things separately. And by giving them a number, and putting those numbers into categories, it's easier to understand what we're working with because if we see account number 207, we know it's a liability account. And we know that its normal balance will be a credit. And et cetera, et cetera, right? We can establish a lot of information by using a common system.
We also learned in chapter one, double entry accounting. We practiced a bunch of examples of double entry accounting. In double entry accounting, well, we enter each transaction twice, or at least twice, could be more. But every transaction is recorded at least twice because it must add to somewhere on the left and to somewhere on the right, so they balance or subtract from both the left and the left or subtract, uh, add and subtract from the left and the right. You cannot balance a transaction with one entry unless that entry is zero, which doesn't make sense. It's not a transaction. So you need two entries. I mean, if you spend a dollar, you got to put minus a dollar somewhere. Well, to get that to equal zero, guess what? You got to do plus a dollar somewhere else. There's no way, unless the transaction's value is zero, which is a transaction not worth recording. If the transaction is non-zero, meaning it's a transaction worth recording, then we need to record it twice. And those two things need to cancel each other out, or, or more than two things. But we'll go with the simple example. That's the reason, the necessity of double entry accounting. And just like we learned, the fundamental equation is assets always equals liabilities plus equity. And I mean that always in the sense that not just at the end of the day, but after every transaction, every transaction is balanced. Every single one of them has entries on both sides of the ledger or entries that cancel themselves out on one or the other side of the ledger. And then we also saw that increases in assets or debits and increases in liabilities and equity or credits. Therefore, from this first principle, we can discern the rule that debits must also always equal credits. It's a function of the accounting equation itself. Assets always equals liabilities plus equity. Increases in assets or debits, decreases in assets or credits. Increases in liabilities and equity or credits decreases our debits. And therefore, from those first principles, we can also derive the rule that debits must always equal credits for every transaction. So let's try some examples. Let's do some illustrative problems and let's use the double entry method on a number of different accounts to see how this works. So we are Big Dog Car Works Corp's accountant and Big Dog Car Works Corp issues a thousand shares of stock to a stockholder and sells those shares. We can think of that as a sale for a total of $10,000 cash. So first we have to recognize which accounts are being impacted. Well, we received a wad of cash. That's affecting our cash account. Cash is an asset account. How do we deal with increases. This is an increase, right? We got cash. We received cash. How do we deal with increases to asset accounts? Increases to assets accounts are always debits. They go in the left-hand column of our T account statement. So very simple. We make a little T. We write cash above it. In the left, we put $10,000 because that's how much cash we got. Something else has to balance. We also need to show this increase on something on the other side of the fundamental equation, either in liabilities or in equity. We need to show this increase as a credit so that debits equal credits. And this is best characterized as an increase to the equity account for common stock. We'll increase that by 10,000. An increase to an equity account results in a credit. And again, it's all based on those first principles of what these accounts are. But yes, debits equal credits. We have $10,000 in debits to cash and $10,000 in credits to common stock. 10,000 equals 10,000. Awesome. And moreover, note that assets equals liabilities plus equity. We have plus 10,000 in assets. We have plus 10,000 in equity. Boom. We're again balanced. Let's try another one. The company borrows 3,000 from the bank. 
what happens when you borrow money from the bank? You get cash, cash money. Cash goes into what account? Your cash account. Cash is what kind of account? An asset account. When you increase a asset account, what do you do? do you, what column do you put it in? You put it in the debits column. Just going to have to memorize that one, guys. You know, when you add money to an asset account, that's in the debits column. That's just that's just the definitional, functional way we do accounting. So left-hand column, 3000 in cash. What happened at the same time? Well, we incurred a liability. What kind of liabilities? We'll call it notes payable, maybe long-term debt, maybe short-term debt, maybe notes payable. They're all types of liabilities. So we have an account for that. For here, let's call it notes payable or debts payable or short-term debt payable, or long-term debt, whatever. It's a liability account. We're adding to it. We're increasing how much we owe. When we increase a liability, that's a credit. And what's the result? We have 3,000 in debits, 3,000 credits. Credits equal debits. Awesome. Let's try another example. Equipment is purchased for $3,000 cash. What has happened here? Well, we're actually going to first... Well, you can do whatever you do first. They're basically happening at the same time. In my mind, first thing is, let's talk about that cash. We are reducing our cash. Cash is what type of account? It's an asset. Cash is an asset. It's a good thing. It has future value. So we are reducing our cash by 3000 because we're literally spending it. Just picture handing $3,000 to an equipment salesman. That cash goes away. When we reduce an asset account that goes in which column? Credits. Right-hand column. You can think of it just right-hand, left-hand. What else happened? Well, we actually obtained a different asset. We exchanged one asset for another. We, got, we traded in cash for equipment. So now we also have a different asset account called the equipment account. And we're increasing that one. That goes in the debits column. 3,000 in debits for equipment. 3,000 in credits for cash. Credits equal debits. Awesome. We're balanced. Let's try another one. We're going to buy a truck. And we're going to pay for it. This gets complicated a little bit. We're going to pay for it with two different sources. First off, we're going to pay with some cash. But we're also going to take out some debt. So first off, let's even look at it from what we're getting first. It's just simpler, right? So what are we getting a truck? How do we book that? We book it based on its original value. What's the value of the truck? 8,000. It's an $8,000 truck. This isn't, this, there's no even math here, guys. What's the original value of the truck? So we have an account. Let's call it the truck account. We can call it the equipment account. We call it the truck account. Truck account. We just increased the value of our truck account. It's our first truck from zero to 8,000 because we now have an $8,000 truck. What is a truck? It's an asset. It has future value. It's going to be valuable in the future. So how do we deal with increasing a asset account? That's a debit. It goes in the left-hand side. Meanwhile, what else happened? Well, we spent cash, 3,000 of our cash. Cash is an asset account. We spent it. We reduced it. We gave it away. We handed $3,000 of cash to somebody else. What happens when you reduce the cash in an asset account? What happens when you reduce the amount of any asset account? That is a credit. Credits go on the right. In addition, what else happened? What else happened was that we also increased our debt, our notes payable, right? We took out 5,000 in debt. We had zero in debt. We now have 5,000. Going from zero to 5,000, that's an increase. And debts, those are liabilities. When you increase a liability, what column does that go in? It goes in your credits column. So what's the result? We have an additional $5,000 of notes payable that goes in the credits. We have a diminution, a reduction in $3,000 of cash assets that also goes in the credits column because right, liabilities and assets are inverted the increase to ones, the reduction of the other. We have a new asset, a truck. The asset goes into the, in the increase in the asset goes to the debit column. So the result, $8,000 debit to truck, $3,000 credit to cash, $5,000 credit to notes payable, 8,000 minus 3,000 minus 5,000 equals zero. Awesome, we're balanced. Let's try another one. 
And by the way, you might notice these are the same transactions from chapter one. We're just booking them differently. We're booking them using T accounts. Okay, transaction number five. We pay today $2,400 cash for a year of insurance. What is that? That's prepaid insurance. Prepaid insurance, that's an asset. It's valuable in the future. We've increased it. We had no insurance. Now we have $2,400 of insurance. What do we do with that? Well, whenever we increase an asset that goes in the debits column. You just got to remember that, guys. When you increase an asset, it goes to debits. It goes on the left-hand side. Just how it works. So we put $2,400 in that column. Where did the money come from? It came from a different asset account. It came from cash. We used cash to buy insurance. We traded one asset for another. When we reduce the amount of cash in our cash account, we're going to account for that on our T account on the credit side because a reduction to an asset is a credit. Yeah, it's just a definitional thing, guys. Just that's what we call it. You reduce your asset. It goes in the credit, goes in the right-hand side. Left-hand side, 2400 in debits for our insurance. Right-hand side, 2400 in credits for cash. 2400 minus 2400 equals zero. We're balanced. Awesome. Let's try another one. Corporation pays 2000 cash to pay off a bank loan. All right, where'd the money come from? Money came from cash. Right? We used cash. We have less cash. What type of account is cash? Cash is an asset. Cash is something valuable in the future. Cash is something you want more of. It's an asset. What do you do with your T accounts when you reduce an asset? Well, when you reduce an asset, we call that a credit. That's the right-hand side. We put it in the right-hand side of the T account. We reduced cash. Therefore, we write 2000 in the right-hand side, the amount we reduced the cash by. Meanwhile, we got something else. We had another transaction occur. What was the other transaction? We reduced our debt. Debt is what? It's a liability. It's something we don't want to have. It's an obligation. It's something that's going to have to cost us money in the future. The... T accounts are conceptually, we always have debits on the left and credits on the right, but conceptually the way they work is reversed because the fundamental equation always has to balance. So we've actually reduced our debt. And when we reduce a liability, that goes in the debits column. When we reduce a liability, it goes in the debits column and that offsets the credit to cash. We reduced cash. We reduced notes payable, or more broadly, we reduced assets and we reduced liabilities. So we have a credit in assets and a credit that matches in our liabilities. 2,000 equals 2,000, or in another way to say it, 2,000 minus 2,000 equals zero. We're balanced. Awesome. Let's try another one. The corporation receives an advance payment $400 for repair services to be performed later. An advance payment, what is that? Unearned revenue. We didn't earn it. We got paid now for work we'll do in the future. We will earn it. We have to earn it. Since we have to do something in the future, that's an obligation. We're obliged to do the work later now. So that's a liability. Unearned repair revenue is a liability, and we have more of it. What happens when we increase a liability? What column do we put it in in our T accounts? We increase a liability, we put that in the credit column. That's just what it means, guys. When we increase a liability, that's a credit. So let's credit unearned repair revenue $400. Put that in the right-hand side. That means we got to find a debit somewhere. Where's our debit? Well, our debit is found because we got cash money. We got 400 for Hamilton's in our pocket now we can put in the bank account. So we have $400 more cash we Put that in the bank account and that's an asset cash is good cash is king cash means we have value for the future When we increase an asset, that's a debit That's just how it works when we increase an asset. That's a debit And so we're going to put that on the debit column 400 minus 400 equals zero. We're balanced. That's awesome. Let's try another one. How about transaction eight? A total of $10,000 of automotive repair services is performed for a customer. Did some work. 
got paid. Got paid 8,000 cash, 2,000 to be paid in 30 days. Okay, what happened here? Hey, the cash is easy. We've done this a number of times now. So what do we do? Cash is what? An asset, right? What categories is it? Everything has to fall into one of three categories, generally speaking, an asset, a liability, or equity. And then from there, we subdivide into accounts. Cash, cash account, that's a asset account. Cash is something valuable in the future. We can spend it later for goods and services. So we're going to add to our cash account. We're going to add to an asset account. When we add to an asset account, which side of the T ledger do we put it in? We put it in the left side. It's a debit. That's just how it works. When we increase an asset, we call that a debit, and that's where that goes. What else did we get? We got $2,000 in a future benefit in accounts receivable. We're entitled to another $2,000. We're entitled to another $2,000. That's a different asset. We'll put in a different account, but it's still an asset account. We've increased an asset account. How do we book that? We book it as a debit. Increases to asset accounts go in the left-hand side because they are debits. Meanwhile, what else happened? How do we balance this equation? Well, once you've seen that we have $10,000 in the left side of the T, we better find $10,000 to put on the right side somewhere. And where do we find it? Well, what have we done? We've done work and increased the value of our business. We've increased our retained revenue. We've increased our equity. When we increase equity or liabilities, that goes in the credits column. It's the inverse. Assets, when they increase, they go to debits. Liabilities and equity, when they increase, they go to credits. Left hand, right hand. So we increase that by 10,000, 8,000 plus 2,000 minus 10,000 equals zero. Balanced. Awesome. Transaction number nine is, I'll admit, a little tricky. So, you know, if you don't pick up 100% of what I'm putting down here, that's cool. Not essential for lawyers to get 110% of this. But here's the story. When we talk about equity, we actually are talking about revenues minus expenses. So equity can be further broken down into revenues and expenses. And moreover, since it's revenue minus expenses, we're going to treat expenses the inverse of other types of equity accounts because they are, in fact, all referred to in the negative. They all deduct from overall equity. You'll see how it plays out here, because in, in transaction number nine, we pay a number of expenses in cash. First, we pay our rent, $1,600. So how does that get recorded? Well, an expense is a negative component of equity. Equity, we would add things to the credit column, but we're adding a negative in the case of expenses. So we add to the debit column. So our rent expense is a debit of 1600 And the same thing for our other expenses, 3500 2000 and 700 for the truck. How did we pay for it? Where did the money come from? It came from our bank account. We paid in cash. What does that mean? Our cash decreased. Now this one, folks, this one you need to know. When you decrease cash, you're decreasing an asset. When you decrease an asset, which side of the T account does it go on? Is that a debit or a credit? How do we refer to a decrease in an asset? A decrease in an asset is a credit. Goes in the right-hand side of the column. When we pay cash out of our bank account, that goes into our T account under cash on the right as a credit. Likewise, accounts payable is a liability. And we're increasing our liabilities. When we increase our liabilities, it's the same thing as decreasing an asset. Likewise, it goes in the credits column. We now have more accounts payable by 700, and that goes in the right-hand side of the column. And when you add it all up, 1,600 plus 3,500 plus 2,000 plus 700 minus 7,100 minus 700 equals zero. Balances. Awesome. Last transaction, number 10, because at the end of the day, the owners want to get paid. So they say, profitable month, let's see some of that cheddar. So we pay $200 in dividends to the shareholder, Bob Baldwin. So where's the money come from? Comes from cash, right? We took cash from our bank account. 
gave it to Bob. So what do we do? We're going to credit cash. We decrease cash. Whenever we decrease an asset, we're going to put that in the credits column and mark that as a right-hand side of the T account transaction for $200. And we have to balance that somewhere. Where do we find a T account where, well, first off, what's the relevant T account? This is coming from equity. So we have to look in our equity accounts. Specifically, what type of equity is this? This is a dividend. Dividends reduce the amount of retained earnings. They reduce the amount of money in our equity accounts generally. So when we reduce equity, what side of the T account does that go on? That reduction goes on the left. That's called a debit. And so we put 200 in the dividends column. 200 minus 200 equals zero. Yes, balanced. So there you go. After the January transactions of Big Dog Car Works Corp were recorded in the T accounts, each account is totaled. The difference between debit and credit is calculated. And thankfully, as we'll see in our example next, we end up with a balanced equation. So what you can see here is a different presentation of the same transactions we've looked at in chapter one and here. We have a number of T accounts for all of the different accounts that had some transactions in this month. We use parentheses around a number symbol to designate which transaction it was. We can have notes on those transactions elsewhere. You can uh, take a snapshot of this if you want to check my math, but I did provide some totals in the footnotes below here. And the beautiful thing is that we have a balanced ledger because we use the double entry method properly and each equation itself balances. So if you look at everywhere there's a nine, that's transaction number nine, and you add up all the debits and all the credits, you'll get zero. Or rather, if you subtract all the debits from all the credits, you'll get zero. Because assets always equals liabilities plus equity. And again, we use the numbers in parentheses to annotate the specific transaction so that we can go back and look at that transaction in more detail. The trial balance is not a financial statement, but it is often the first step accountants take toward making financial statements. But for our purposes, we're actually going to treat it as a second or even a third step in our process for educational purposes. Remember that the first step was simply to journal all of the transactions that happened. And the point of step one was to determine which account should be increased or decreased. Then in step two, we took each of those accounts and wrote a T and we determined whether those increases or decreases resulted in a credit or a debit. And then we combined or summed or added all of those debits and credits with a plus for all the debits for an asset and the minus for all the credits for an asset. And, and that resulted in an overall total for that account after all the transactions that happened in that period were said and done. Did the account go up or go down? If the account went up and it was an asset account, we then had a balance in the debits, which is called a normal balance. Uh, similarly, if we had a number of transactions in liabilities or equity and we ended up with a positive amount, uh, a greater amount in credits, that would also be a normal balance. In any event, we take that final number, we take the result, the sum of all those transactions, and that becomes the balance for that account for that period. And that is the formative part of the trial balance. The trial balance is going to list the result of all those monthly transactions uh, added together. And we're going to use that to first create the trial balance and then use that trial balance to create our financial statements. So here is a trial balance with a couple of features that we've discussed. So let's take a moment here and recap. First off, we have account numbers. Those are arbitrarily assigned but we made some decisions to 
put certain types of accounts in certain number ranges. We elected the convention that number account numbers uh, 100 through 199 would be assets, 200 to 299 liabilities, 300 to 399 common stock retained earnings and dividend, 500 to 599 are revenue accounts, 600 to 699 are expense accounts, etc. We covered that back on slide 19 for those who are keeping track. Anyway, we see those numbers replicated here. And what we've done is we have tabulated all of the transactions that have happened to these accounts and given a final number, whether we're in the debits or the credits, depends on whether or not we're in assets or liabilities or equities and whether that number is up or down from where we started. Starting with cash, we see that we have 3,700 debited to cash a debit to an asset is an increase, so that means we have $3,700 more cash than when we started. Next, accounts receivable, et cetera, et cetera. All of those are to the positive, and so when we've increased our assets, we're going to put that in the debits column on the left. Likewise, when we increase a liabilities, we put that in the right. And by the way, we call this a normal balance because that's what usually happens. We usually would see... I shouldn't say usually, but it's called a normal balance because it's often enough that we would have a pattern that looks just like this, that the transactions are positive uh, on both sides, which means we have debits for assets and credits for liabilities, which is a common feature in a balance sheet. So we see that our liabilities numbered from 200 to 299, notes payable, accounts payable, unearned revenue, those all increased. So those go in our credits column. In addition, we increased our common stock. We sold some stock. So that's going to go as a credit because an increase to equity is also a credit. It goes in the right-hand column. We decreased our retained earnings, which is a type of equity, by 200. So that's not a normal balance. And that goes in the debit side. And we had our other revenue and expenses as discussed. And then again, at the bottom, we see that we have the same number in debits and credits because debits must always equal credits just like assets must always equal liabilities plus equity. And so this here is what's called a trial balance. The double entry method requires that debits equal credits just like it requires that assets equals liabilities plus equity. The trial balance establishes that this equality exists for our company. But it doesn't ensure that each item was put in the correct account. We could have gotten the same result if we mistakenly put cash into the truck account, because those are both assets. We still would have balanced overall, but we wouldn't have accounted for the right account. So a trial balance doesn't do that for us. Neither does the trial balance ensure that all items that should have been entered have been entered. We could have missed something. We could have duplicated things. Any or all of these errors could occur, and the trial balance would still balance. So having the trial balance balance is what we call a necessary but not a sufficient condition. In other words, if the trial balance doesn't balance, you've got a problem. If the trial balance balances, we can do some more tests and checks. But merely having a trial balance balance doesn't mean we've got everything accounted for properly because it didn't measure, for example, if we put certain assets into the right asset account or if we accounted for all transactions or didn't double count a transaction. That said, still a really useful way to make sure that we are at least in line with what we expect to have for our accounting summary. Since we can't rely on the trial balance to ensure that we've accounted for everything, but it's a good start, that's our first step, once we've got a trial balance that balances, we're going to now prepare our financial statements, and we're going to start typically with the income statement. Let's prepare an income statement based on our trial balance. Now, the trial balance is not a financial statement. It's a step toward a financial statement, and it's a good first step to make sure that we are generally balance between our assets, liabilities, and equity, although it doesn't necessarily get the accounts right. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to translate that into our income statement. The income statement 
cares about, looks at revenue and expenses, right? How much money came in, how much money went out, how much income did we receive, and how much was that offset? Now, an income statement doesn't have to balance. It could be positive or negative. Our net income could be more than zero or less than zero in a given month, depending on whether we made money or lost it. So let's take a look. We're going to first look at our revenues. Our revenues are going to go into our right-hand side. We're going to then tabulate our expenses on the left-hand side and result at a net income of positive $2,200. Whatever income we make in a month, we're then going to translate that into retained earnings. So whatever we made and didn't spend, we keep. Keep as in retain, retain as in retained earnings. And now it's going to factor into equity when we get down to the balance sheet later. So let's then move that 2,200 net income to increase the retained earnings in our shareholders equity statement. And what else is relevant for shareholder equity? Well, how about the common stock that we sold and the dividends we issued? So we're going to bring those down from the trial balance as well. And that results in a statement of shareholders equity. We start with the beginning of the period, whatever it was from the last report, and then we talk about changes. What happened this month? What happened this month? We issued $10,000 of stock. We're going to increase the common stock column. We also took a net income of $2,200. We're going to add that to our retained earnings column. We issued a dividend of $200. We're going to subtract that from retained earnings and mark that as dividends, and that's going to give us our ending balance of $12,000 in shareholders' equity. The asset and liability accounts from the trial balance and the ending balances for common stock and retained earnings on the statement of shareholders' equity are then used to prepare the balance sheet. Remember that in our last slide, we subtracted our expenses from our revenues and used that to derive our income statement. And then we used the total of the income statement to add or subtract from the retained earnings on our statement of shareholder equity. And now we're going to translate all that information forward into our balance sheet. We're next going to prepare our balance sheet from our trial balance and some of the information that we derived from our creating the income statement, which then flowed into creating the statement of shareholder equity. So let's start by looking at what we hadn't looked at before, which is our assets and liabilities, and let's book them. So we've already recorded that we had several asset transactions all in the debits column. We increased cash, we increased accounts receivable, we increased prepaid insurance, we increased our equipment, we bought a truck, we increased truck account. All of our asset accounts went up and let's total all of that together. Our total assets are now $19,100 and they have to equal liabilities plus equity. What happened in the same period? Over the same period, we also increased a number of our liability accounts. We incurred $700 in accounts payable, $400 in unearned repair revenue, and $6,000 in debt through notes, which totals to $7,100 in new liabilities. Uh-oh, what the heck? Liabilities and assets don't equal. Well, that's okay. Remember that we also have equity. And when we calculated shareholder equity previously, what number did we get to? 12,000. And, small miracles, what's the difference between assets and liabilities? 12,000. That's our equity. And therefore, we have in fact arrived at a balanced balance sheet. Let's review what we learned. The income statement is linked to the statement of stockholders equity because the revenue and expenses reported on the income statement show the details of net income and that net income then becomes retained earnings on the statement of shareholder equity. The statement of stockholders equity is then linked to the balance sheet because the statement of stockholders equity shows the details of how equity changed during the accounting period which makes up for the difference between assets and liabilities if we've done this right. The balance sheet summarizes equity by showing only account balances from common stock and retained earnings. 
To obtain the details regarding these equity accounts, we have to look at the income statement and the statement of stockholders' equity. Again, the balance sheet is derived from other more fundamental statements, and so if we want details, we go to those for the details. Since this is a course for lawyers who are primarily concerned with consuming and not producing accounting information, I'm going to move quickly through this next section, especially given how close we are to an hour of this lecture. So a couple things to keep in mind. Accountants use the term general journal or just journal to talk about the chronologic record, which you could keep on a day-to-day -day basis, just like you might make a journal entry every day in order to have a chronology of what happened in your life. The ledger, on the other hand, is not chronological, but rather is going to match the journal entries uh, and to give a final accounting so that you can produce the statements that lawyers tend to read and use. There are a number of conventions with how we record journal entries. You put the year here, you put the date here. It's very stylized. And the reason for it being stylized is this helps make them more readable and repeatable because we know exactly how these things are done. I wouldn't worry too much about these conventions if you are an attorney. The conventions are followed by most accountants, but once again, uh, lawyers will generally be reviewing the final documents, and it's probably worth taking a refresher course if you find yourself in a position of recording journals themselves, which are the preliminary documents. The journal entries will be recorded in a very standardized way. Let's look at a couple images of what a journal looks like, just so you're at least superficially familiar with it. Here is an image of a general journal, and you can see that we're going to be running chronologically through dates. We begin with January 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These are just dates of the year, and as transactions happen, we record them as they occur, regardless of what account, because the journal is chronological. As we go through the month, we'll just continue accumulating journal entries. Every time there's a transaction, we're just going to record it in chronological order in the journal. If a given journal entry has more than one debit or credit, we call that a compound entry. Many entries are compound entries, so just a term of art there. Then we're going to translate that to the general ledger, or just ledger, which is a formal variety of the T account. And we're going to maintain these ledger accounts and use them to create our financial statements. Here's an example of how we translate from the general journal into the general ledger. And a key thing to note is that now, instead of simply recording the entries, we're also going to continue uh, having a running balance as we tabulate in total all the transactions as they go along, because we're going to get to the end result of a balanced ledger at the end of the transaction period. Just like there are formalized steps in recording journal entries, there are formalized steps in recording ledger entries. You record them in a folio in this way and that way. It's not really that fundamentally critical for most lawyers to understand how we post transactions on the general ledger. But again, if you find yourself in a position where as an attorney, you need to review the general ledger or even recreate financial statements, I'd really recommend refreshing your recollection of this material. We're almost at an hour here, so let's go ahead and conclude this lecture by talking about how it all kind of comes together, and hopefully it's coming together for you now that you're starting to see time and time again how these transactions happen. We have this thing called the accounting cycle, and we see that we are going to take several discrete steps in a particular order to arrive at financial statements. This is that order, and hopefully it also is a recap of everything we learned so far. Step one, we're going to journal our transactions. Journaling consists of analyzing transactions as they occur in chronological order to see which accounts they effect and how they'll affect the accounting equation. Then, once we've recorded them chronologically through a period, we can then 
create a ledger from that information. The ledger begins by summarizing the transactions by account. So instead of organizing things chronologically as they are in a journal, which makes sense because a journal is something you enter daily over time, we're then going to put them in a ledger where we're going to put them account by account. And step three, we're going to prove that debits equal credits. Debits must equal credits for the balance sheet to balance. We're going to do that first by preparing a trial balance. The trial balance is based on the ledger, which has the information that happened first chronologically, now organized into accounts. And we're going to provide the account numbers and names, and that account number will also clue us into whether those are asset liabilities, common stock, retained earnings, dividend accounts, revenue accounts, expense accounts, etc. Step four, the summarized transactions are communicated into our income statement, which is also used to compute our statement of change in shareholder equity, which is then used to create the balance sheet. And so we have a whole sequence or cycle or process. It begins with simple journal entries, every transaction listed and correctly put as debit or credit or a compound entry. And then that's going to be rolled into a ledger where we organize things by account. From there, we create a trial balance. From the trial balance, we create our preliminary financial statements. And from there, we create our balance sheet.